Dear all, after the most inspiring talk by Robert Chia, we proceed to a very special part of this colloquium where we celebrate the accomplishments, the work of Egotians. The Egos Award ceremony at the 31st Egos Colloquium. I would like to start with a very special award. Diego's honorary member for 2015. Since 1998, uh, Egos honors and celebrates scholars who with their work have had strong voices in the social sciences and who have contributed immensely to our community, Egos. Therefore, on this occasion, I am particularly delighted and honored to announce that the EGOS Honorary Member for 2015 is David Wilson. <laughs> to welcome our new Honorary Member, I would like to invite for Laudacio Ziad Marar, Global Publishing Director of SAGE, the publisher of our journal, Organization Studies. Thanks, Sylvia. Wow, it really is an incredible honor and a great pleasure to be able to deliver this introduction to David Wilson, who I know requires no real introduction, but I'll try. I first met David Wilson nearly 15 years ago at Warwick Business School on a visit which stays in my memory because I encountered a man of such great charm and warmth, which is still true today and very instantly connected with someone who's become since a close friend and a really excellent professional um, collaborator. I'll come back to that though because I would like to just start with a few highlights of his remarkable career, admittedly abbreviated given limited time. Um, the story starts in Bradford in the 70s, where Dave joined David Hickson's research team to help produce what was, at the time, the largest empirical study of strategic decision-making in various types of organizations, known internationally as the Bradford Studies. In the mid-80s saw Dave move from Bradford to Warwick University, where he was part of the new intake tasked with creating what was to become the Warwick Business School. And Dave's research had begun to focus in on voluntary organizations where his research unit explored um, strategy and structure in those kinds of institutions in the UK. And um, that resulted in a number of uh, journal articles um, that he co-published with uh, Richard Butler and including a monograph which has since been reissued this year showing the ongoing relevance of that work. After a four-year spell as research director at Aston University, Dave came back to Warwick Business School in 97 and revived the Bradford decision-making studies, teaming up once again with David Hickson and this time adding Susan Miller to the team. The next few years were spent creating a longitudinal timeline to tell the story of turning strategy into practice, probably before it was uh, the hot theme of the day. Um, and I was struck by the fact that he commented that during doing that research, many of the informants he spoke to were the very same people he'd interviewed only 20 years before, which sort of gave the lie to the suggestion that you get major churn happening in modern organizations. And as, as a relevant data point myself, who's about to turn 26 years at SAGE, I was taken by that fact. Um, but alongside his considerable research output, Dave's a highly, highly um, able teacher and administrator. Um, his teaching reflected in the many Teaching Excellence Awards he's had and his um, administration in having been um, Deputy Dean at Warwick Business School and then Acting Dean in 2010. Um, he resisted a further spell of deanship and then ran the head, became Head of Department in Sociology um, where he and his team won a sizable three-year research grant um, which will provide one of the largest databases and analy analyses of employment and labour markets for young people in the UK. Work he continues as a research dean at the Open University to this day now. Um, along the way, he's been a passionate supporter of PhDs, young scholars, and supervised many, one of whom I was speaking to only last night, who was talking in the highest and most glowing terms about his enabling ability to help people find their voices, 
to do without getting in their way, um, but to inspire through a constructive criticism and engagement their appetite for the research process and the love of it. Um, so alongside influencing people who've now gone on to influence others, and on, alongside all those journal papers, alongside research monographs, and indeed finding time for a couple of textbooks along the way, his contribution has been very significant. And yet, of course, we know that he's got this relationship with organization studies, which is indeed where the relationship that we developed really did get cemented. Anyone who was working at the Bradford Management Center in the 70s will have been part of the birth of organization studies. And David, in particular, was a very active participant in its early stages of launching the journal, indeed publishing a paper in volume three, um, taking on various editorial roles, including being uh, deputy editor when Aunt Sorga was editor, and then editor-in-chief, of course, which he did for many years before handing over to Harry Tsukas in 2003. And, of course, his ongoing relationship with organization studies is formalized through his role um, as the EGOS board member responsible for that, um, for the development of the journal. And that's, of course, where we, we get most closely involved in, in work with David. And, and Kieran, who's over there, and I, and this team at SAGE generally have had the great pleasure of working with David for many, many years and have valued his professionalism and wise counsel throughout. He lives and breathes the journal, but he does so with a lightness of touch and an understanding that relationships are to be conducted in a spirit of mutual respect and, ideally, a lot of fun. And it was particularly, therefore, apt for David to explain at the beginning of the relationship between SAGE and OS that we should have an annual dinner each time just to cement that culture and deepen and embed those networks. And the fact that he has a profound passion for red wine may possibly have had something to do with it. Um, and indeed, he has many passions. Um, in fact, there are alternative versions of David that only certain twists of fate have taken away from us. There's Dave, the professional guitarist. There's Dave, Dave the professional uh, racer of, of uh, road bikes. And anyone that think who was at the, uh, I think, the 2001 colloquium in Lyon would know what I'm talking about. But those alternative Daves have given away to the actual one. And the actual one, of course, um, probably most, most profoundly for this event, um, is the lifelong commitment he's shown to EGOS itself. Um, as, as he's put it, cut Dave in two, and you will probably read EGOS all the way through. Um, he's been a member since its foundation, a former chair, and a board member for 12 consecutive years, which has got to be some kind of a record. Um, and in this time, he's provided a continuing thread of insight and know-how and encouragement, and crucially, an ability to step in at critical junction, junctures uh, in EGOS history. There have been various inflection points which have critically depended on, on, on Dave really understanding and providing the insight and the, and, and the um, advice needed, and sometimes a decision to, to be taken. Um, and yet, while being that sort of wise head, he's always had this ongoing commitment and active support of, of PhDs and early career scholars um, at each EGOS colloquium, and typical, I think, of his dedication to the next generations all the time. So anyway, people's favorite words to conclude. Um, I've only been able to offer just glimpses of Dave's amazing contributions through a selection of lenses, but he is much more than the sum of those parts. Um, and actually, just over the last few days, it's been an enormous pleasure in getting ready for this speech um, just to have people talk a little bit about Dave and say how much he's mattered to them, how impressed they, am by, they are by him and how, how much affection he's held in. And it's a great pleasure to see that reflected back through these other voices. And, and if a theme emerges or even converges, it's this, that Dave is a Negosian through and through, but crucially, he's a Negosian without ego. And I've heard that version said in one way or another, and I think the essence of him can be distilled in a word that he himself reserves as the highest praise he gives to others, human. That his stance towards others is generous and enabling and has allowed voices to grow and to strengthen. And George Eliot once said that the growing good of the world owes much to unhistoric acts of kindness. And I think I speak for many in this room who've been grateful recipients of Dave's good spirits and warm words. And I'd like to think he sets an example of what it is to be a human in an age in which such qualities are increasingly rare and yet incredibly precious. So with that, please join me in congratulating David Wilson to come up as an honorary member for EGOS for 2015.
Thank you very much. Um, it's all been said, really. I don't know who that was about, but I'm, I'm very happy to accept on whoever this person is, their behalf, this, uh, this EGOS on Remember. Um, 41 years is a long time, but as we've just heard, Adam Ferguson said we couldn't have imagined in the 1970s what EGOS was to become. It may interest some people who weren't even born when the first EGOS colloquium took place that there was one sub-theme just one sub-theme. It may also uh, be appropriate to know that I was presenting a paper at that sub-theme um, and I was absolutely terrified. Um, but some things don't change. Um, EGOS still has the capacity, I think, to terrify people when they're giving papers. Uh, and and uh, many of the young colleagues I work with say, ooh, EGOS, that's a bit tricky, isn't it? You know, somebody else presents your paper for you and uh, tears you apart. But actually, um, it's a historic moment for me, and I'd just like to thank Ziad for his, uh, his talk about humanity. I think the next generation are the most important things. The, ne the new scholars who are going to lead EGOS and, and develop this community, which has gone from 30-odd people to today, uh, about 1,800 people on this campus, which is a tremendous, and about over 2,000 members. There's, there was a reason we started EGOS, and there's still a reason, reason today, which I think in every country in the world we see the neoliberal tendencies to create uh, education as a, a, a business, as education as something that can be commodified. And um, I just don't believe that. Uh, and EGOS is part of that collective action against that kind of individual decimation. And I think that that's something that is really important to me. And I know you will continue. As I fall off the board, metaphorically, I become an ordinary EGOS member. Um, but I really look forward to celebrating EGOS's 50th anniversary just as an EGOS ordinary member. So I'll still be around. Uh, my hair will be darker. It will be, won't be dying it darker. And my hair, will, the hair was dark when I started, uh, but it will remain this colour and probably less of it. But I'd like to thank everybody in Egos for supporting me. I've had a great time. It's felt like 41 seconds and not 41 years, and I think that says it all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. David rightfully has noticed on honorary membership is not a retirement package. So we hope to see him in many different capacities in many colloquiums to come. Uh, we continue with uh, Diego's Best Paper Award, Best Student Paper Award, and that's an interesting award. And I would like to invite Yanis Gabriel on the stage to announce the winners. Thank you, Sylvia. And this is a great moment in which I will invite the winners uh, of, th uh, of three awards under three different categories from last year's uh, Amsterdam, uh, Rotterdam Colloquium. And this will be their opportunity to thank their moms and dads for, the, for all their help and support in producing work of outstanding quality, uh, which uh, has uh, drawn the attention and the praise of uh, panels under three different categories. The first award that I will present is uh, the Thank you. Uh, the EGOS Best Paper Award, which carries uh, a, a 2,000 euro award, and it's sponsored by the Hanken School of Economics in Finland. Now, after a process in which uh, some 55 uh, papers were read by, by at least two members of this panel and narrowed down to a short list of uh, 12, three papers made it to the final short list, which are the three papers we have here. Let me say a few words about each one of those papers because they were really all three quite outstanding and I'm sure that you will appreciate some of the ideas that uh, surfaced. So Leanne Catcher, Karen Dale and Melissa Tyler's Uncanny Resemblances, Remembering as Forgetting in Organizational Commemoration. Drawing on Casey's account of Remembering as Forgetting and Freud's account of the Uncanny they demonstrated how commemorations help create ideal subjectivities that very often perpetuate patterns of exclusion and marginalization. The second paper on the short, short list, Marie-Laure Gelic and uh, Reza Mouzavi, Understanding the Structural Architecture of Performative Ideologies, The Case of Atlas and Neoliberalism, describes how a neoliberal think tank, Atlas, 
became the vehicle for the rapid dilution of the blueprint of think tank across the globe, helping to inscribe particular ideologies and values in a variety of different contexts. The third paper uh, in the short list used Luke's and Maddie Janssen's legitimacy of multinational companies as a class, rhetorical strategies to establish a positive act or image in the public debate, identified different rhetorical strategies used to legitimize uh, multinational corporations at the class level in the media and examined how these strategies change over time and how actor images become associated with particular types of legitimacy. And the winner is Leanne Katcher, Karen Dale, and Melissa Tyler. Now the second award that I will be presenting is the Best Student Paper Award, for which only papers which are, uh, in which the principal author is uh, a student are eligible. And this is uh, uh, sponsored by the HSC in Montreal, uh, Canada, and it carries a 2,000 euro price. And once again, uh, a procedure saw us uh, narrow down a formidable range of, uh, array of uh, nominated papers. Uh, to, uh, to three eligible ones in the short, short list, uh, which included uh, Guillaume Flamand, How do businesses, um, uh, business schools misemploy art for leadership development, from art as a risk to art as a discursive opportunity for beautiful leadership, uh, arguing that art more often than not is a risk in leadership development programs rather than a benefit, and it is often used to legitimate practices that are far from beautiful or desirable. The second paper by Ryan Elizabeth Manning, A Place for Emotion, How Space Structures Nurse-Parent Interactions in West Af African Pediatric Wards, is a powerful ethnographic study of West African Hospital, which offers deep insights into the emotional experiences of nurses as they uh, with very limited uh, space and access to no private spaces at all, working under constant pressure from patients and relatives. The third paper is by Todd Schifferling, The Struggle for Control over the Movement of, in the Market, Activists, Marketers and Green Products, which demonstrates the influences of environmental movement on the behavior of markets as being highly unpredictable, complex and very often counterproductive. And the winner of this award is Ryan Elizabeth Manning. Now, I have spoken to Ryan at length on several occasions, uh, informed her of the success of her paper, which is a very, very powerful piece, which I would strongly encourage you to read. Uh, unfortunately, she's not able to be with us uh, today, but she's sending uh, her best regards to the conference to its delegates and expresses a profound thanks for the award uh, given to her. Now we come to the third uh, paper, uh, there it is, the third paper award, and that's a paper, uh, uh, a more recent award, which is sponsored by the Aalto University School of Business in Finland, and that's referred to as the That's Interesting Award, which also carries a 2,000 uh, euro uh, prize. Now this award, uh, is, uh, in, invites uh, submissions uh, from uh, rather less uh, uh, conventional papers, which are full of ideas, which challenge assumptions, and which uh, inspire the response that's interesting. Uh, let's think about it. And it's been uh, particularly uh, pleasant for me to read uh, some 50, 55 uh, nom uh, papers nominated under this award, because they each and every one of them uh, involves something original and highly provocative. Uh, once again, we narrowed down uh, these um, nominations to three papers, uh, which include uh, Emilio Marti. Uh, once again, if you uh, would like to hear some of the crucial features, Emilio's uh, exploited investors, how the shareholder value orientation gets stabilized through, through the crisis it creates. 
very provocatively argues that how financial price demonstrates that financial crisis indu induced by ex excessive complexity that they lead to a fragmented sense making that paradoxically helps stabilize shareholder values and hence uh, acts as a me mechanism for reestablishing stability after crisis. The second paper by William Ocasio, Christopher Steele, and Michael Mouthkopf, History, Society, and Institutions, The Role of Collective Memory in the Formation of society, uh, Societal Logics, demonstrates how societal logics as, act as material filters through which history is shaped and interpreted, affecting the future nat narrativization of events and incidents. The third nominated paper by Ras Vince, The Unconscious and Institutional Work, draws together on the language of institutional theory and psychoanalysis to offer a highly original insight into the unconscious dimensions of institutional work. And the winner of this award is Ras Vince. Final announcement to make. I'm, uh, I've also been tasked to uh, make the announcement of uh, the, the Gregor McClellan Doctoral Dissertation Award, which was made, uh, uh, which was made uh, last night. This is an award for the best doctoral dissertation and carries an annual price of five thousand pounds, which promotes and recognizes innovative uh, PhD research. Its primary focus is to, um, to recognize research that is both expansive and imaginative, and it is supported by the Journal of Management Studies and the Society for the Advancement of Management Studies. It's, um, uh, Gregor McClelland was the founding editor of Journal of Management Studies and the initiator of SAMS, and the founding di director of the Ma uh, Manchester Business School. Uh, the dissertations for this award go through um, very uh, exhaustive uh, uh, vetting procedure, uh, and uh, the jury consists of representatives from uh, JMS, uh, SAMS, and EGOS. And this year, three, three dissertations were uh, made into the final shortlist. Hila Lifsitz Asaf, Shifting Loci of Innovation, a Study of Knowledge Boundaries, Identity, and Innovation at NASA. Eric Zhao, Institutional Complexity of National Systems in the Fate of Global Microfinance, and Tiona Zuzul, Entrepreneurship and Innovation in the Nascent Industries. And the winner last night, uh, the, the award last night was um, given to Hila Lifshitz Asaf, uh, Shifting Loci of Innovation, a Study of Knowledge Boundaries, Identity and Innovation in NASA, which drew very complimentary comments. Thank you. Next, we continue with uh, an award that is given biannually. Uh, that is the Roland Calori Prize for 2015, uh, to be presented by Frank Denhon, the co-editor in chief of our journal, Organization Studies. Welcome, Frank. Thank you very much. I feel honored to have been asked to present um, the winner of the Roland Calori Award this year on behalf of the EGOS Board Organization Studies and EM Lyon, who are the three supporters of this uh, award. As you can see, as you may remember, this prize is awarded every second year, so all the articles that have been published, that were published in 2013 and 2014 in organization studies were considered. They were considered by a, a, a jury comprising of a long list of uh, well-established uh, scholars under the uh, guidance of David Wilson and Mike Gebhardt. I would like to thank them for their work because 
I guess it is a long work to read two complete volumes of a journal, even if they are as interesting as the volumes of organization studies. <laughs> so, after long consideration, a long shortlist emerged. Do you want me to read all the names and all the <laughs> article titles? <laughs> I guess, for the sake of time, that you take your looks, you slowly go from the top down and appreciate all these high quality papers. And then the winner is a paper by Ignacy Marti and Pablo Fernandez on the institutional work of oppression and resistance, learning from the Holocaust. If you allow me, to read for you uh, some comments by the jury about this paper, you may get an understanding of why this paper was chosen. This is a paper which examines extremes, the Holocaust as an example of oppression and resistance. Many social scientists have given various accounts of the Holocaust, Hannah Arendt not being the least among them. But its study in organization theory is relatively scant. The authors draw our attention to the importance of studying theoretically and empirically events which may be described as extreme and in which we can begin to make sense of power, rule, oppression and resistance. And the paper takes a critical stance towards institutional theory, showing how its relative lack of concern with agency and its interactions with social and organizational structures presents a serious problem in trying to examine processes such as oppression and resistance. In addition, the Roland Calori Prize and the panel look for papers that will likely become landmark papers, key reference points for other researchers in the field. This was judged to be one such paper. As organization theorists increasingly study extremes, such as terrorism, economic meltdowns, and extreme social inequalities, this paper will serve as a key study in the field and will act to inform future research over the next decades. I would like to add that <coughs> for this paper, um, I read it again not so long ago, and I was touched again by the paper, and it reminded me of many of the discussions that we have in my home country, the Netherlands. Every year, there is a commemoration of the Second World War and there is a committee who does that for the entire country. And there's always a sort of a debate, how should we do this? And the theme, the underlying theme in these discussions is how to move beyond the lest we not forget. I read this paper as a wonderful example of how a major event in the history, not so long history, how it can be re-given um, meaning and inspiration for examining our lives today and for tomorrow. That was something I really took out of this uh, paper. So I'm really happy to hand over the prize to Ignacy and Pablo, but unfortunately they are not here. Pablo is in Argentina on his work, Ignacy is on sabbatical with uh, Pablo, so from here our congratulations to them and I'm sure that they will be very, very grateful for this uh, award. Instead of Ignacy and Pablo, who else could we have than Sofia to hand over the award with the request? <laughs> to hand it over to Ignacy and Pablo. Thank you. From this year, we have uh, one new award. And to announce it, I would like to invite to the stage John Child and Martin Eric. This is, this is a new award, as Sylvia's just said. And Martin and I have both played a bit of a role in the process that's led to the award. So we're both going to say a few words, which is only fair. Um, 
Some of you may not know Max. He died at a relatively young age of cancer in September 2011, but he was a very regular attender, a contributor, and I think also he was a convener from time to time of Ego. So he was a very good Egosian. Uh, just say a few background, uh, a few words of background about his life. Um, he used the concept of space a lot, and when you realise he was trained as an architect, you begin to understand this. So he started off life as a trained architect. He then became a senior manager in the now rather notorious uh, conglomerate of uh, Slater Walker uh, Securities but he was in charge of one of the uh, subsidiaries, uh, and then decided to uh, quit managerial life, although in many ways later on he became an, uh, an academic manager and entrepreneur. He took a, a, a PhD at Imperial College, London, completed it in 18 months. His external examiner said that it was the most innovative PhD he'd ever read, so there's encouragement for those of you who are st still struggling with the, the process of getting your doctorate. Uh, and it was the PhD that, in the PhD, you have the germ of his conceptualization, which he uh, carried through and continued to develop uh, through the rest of his uh, uh, writing and academic career around the role of uh, information and then later knowledge in the, the way, for example, it was not only culturally informed, but how it was associated with the uh, relationship and social construction of, of social entities. Now, it was a, it is a, a, a relatively parsimonious scheme. In terms of Robert Char's analysis, it's an interesting one because it contains within it a dynamic of, of learning and a knowledge development and that dynamic is to do partly with the tension between concrete experience, uh, the rough experience that Robert mentioned, and abstraction, through, to some extent, the intermediate stage of codification of experience. And Max has always conceived of this as a, a cycle. Uh, and this analysis has been applied to a whole range of uh, uh, issues uh, that we face in the world in organization studies, but also in understanding the development of whole societies. And in his earlier work uh, in China, uh, and I got involved with him in this, this scheme was quite enlightening. Several articles appeared in ASQ uh, to, as a way of explaining what progression was China making as a society and economy. Was it moving towards a Western model of so-called market economy or not, and the conclusion was not. Uh, he, he was one of the first to coin the phrase which is now fairly familiar, network capitalism, uh, largely as a result of trying to make sense through applying his, his, his analysis of, of information and knowledge to, to China. And then he, uh, and I was still involved a bit with him at that stage, uh, turned this analysis to understanding organizational complexity and particularly how organizations cope with complexity, distinguishing between cognitive and relational complexity, for example, and how it was coped with. And again, drawing quite a lot on examples from China compared with uh, Western examples. Um, now, Martin and I, I should have said earlier, uh, have had the privilege of working with Max. In my case, it was uh, in the, let's say, the first half of his productive academic life. And Martin, as he'll explain in a moment, has worked with Max in his more recent work on the strategic management of knowledge and also on big science. The last major project Max was, in, Max was involved in, and it was still continuing when he died, was to understand how CERN uh, the European uh, Scientific Centre um, uh, near Geneva. How was it that an organisation that had, is it how many thousand scientists? 3,000 3, 3, scientists from about 28 countries could produce and be so creative and produce uh, 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 experiments that led to the discovery of the uh, and identification of the Higgs boson particle, for example, without, with very little hierarchy. And that's something that fascinated Max and of course could 
potentially be a template we could learn from in terms of the way forward to a more sort of humane and uh, effective uh, way of, of organizing large units because CERN is itself a large unit and yet managed to do to, to be innovative and progressive without a significant hierarchy. So I'm going to hand over. Martin was more involved with this recent work with Max and uh, I'll just ask Martin to say a few words and also explain the, the nature of the award and how uh, it's come about. Uh. All right. So organizational complexity, China, the strategic management of knowledge, and most recently, big science, those were uh, for important topics for his research. Now, the very special thing about being a researcher, a good researcher, is that you have the option to become immortal. Immortal through your work, through your articles. And after Max passed away uh, much too early, we assembled a team of former colleagues and friends and edited a book, um, Knowledge, Organization and Management, with Oxford University Press, and we decided to donate all the royalties uh, from the book um, to fund a prize um, here at EGOS for um, a paper that deals with uh, one of the topics that Max was interested in. Now, you've seen the other awards, it's 2,000 euros. We only have 250 euros. That means you have to buy more books because, as I said before, the books fund the price. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, Max's work, um, I think it's a very nice uh, compendium of uh, the different facets uh, of research he was interested in. Um, John, I, and uh, Yasmin Morali also published an organization studies paper last year. If you want to have a shorter overview of Max's work. Um, so we had the privilege of working with uh, Anne Langley, um, reviewing papers uh, from last year. We had a short list of 25 papers and uh, selected one very special paper for this inaugural award, which John will now The, uh, the uh, uh, award was, um, we decided in the end the award should go to a team uh, from uh, Amsterdam, uh, VU University at Amsterdam and the University of Amsterdam. Lisa Law Havermans, Diane Den Hartog and Anne Keegan uh, for their paper which was delivered, as Martin said, at last year's ECOS conference, called Exploring the Role of Leadership in Enabling Contextual Ambidexterity. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, uh, the authors are not able, haven't been able to come to EGOS this year. And so Wendy Smith is going to accept the award of the certificate on their behalf. So thank you. <laughs>